Hello ladies and gentlemen, this is Trisha with Insectopia, and I am so sorry that I lost track of time tonight. Um, I guess I sat down, I, I had sat down on the couch after eating dinner, and I definitely might have taken a short nap. Um, but we are back and here, um, and... I was going to ask the uh, the chat if there were any insects that anyone out there really had the desire to sketch at all, um, but if not, I have a sunburst diving beetle, and I mean, he comes with a, he comes with a cute backstory. I believe I caught him in a watering hole in Arizona. Um... One of those, uh, oh, there's a really good word for them. There's a really good word for watering holes in, um, Arizona. And I think it's like the Spanish word for cup or bowl. And um, the, it means that it's like a, a rock in the desert that holds water all year round. So um, I was in this watering hole that can get very, very shallow during the dry season, but is always holding water. And then um, when I was in it, it was actually pretty deep. It was above my waist. Um, and I uh, had kind of jumped in and was collecting a couple bugs for everybody on a, an insect collecting trip. And I ended up with this beautiful sunburst diving beetle. It's not C note, is it? Hi, Susan! Yay! Thank you! Um, I don't know what you mean by it's not C note. So our common name here is Sunburst Diving Beetle. Hi, Caitlin! If you guys weren't here when I had, if you guys weren't here when I had first came on, I did apologize for being a little late today. <laughs> Oh, this beetle is cute. I do love them. And when we flip him over, um, because we, we might as well flip him over and check out his legs, too. Um, when we flip him over, I think you're going to fall in love with his hind legs. They are cute little swimming legs. Um, so this, uh, this beetle, we know actually this one all the way down to species. So, um, sunburst diving beetles are in the genus Thermonectus, and the epithet is Marmoratus. Thermonectus Marmoratus. So that is uh, that's the species of our sunburst diving beetle. Um, they are in the family Dytiscidae, which is a, a whole family of diving beetles. Um, sunburst diving beetle generally refers to this species. So that's cool because there aren't very many, like if you're looking at um, the terms for insects out there in the world, many insects don't get their own name for their species, common name for their species. Many of them get a common name for their, for their family and then they're lucky if a handful of them get species names. Um, so this one is one of those lucky ones. Let's see. Thermonectus marmoratus. All right, and so I was thinking that I'm probably, we're going to see how long it takes us to sketch the top, but I'm going to sketch the top um, with my, with my page, uh, landscape because if we have time we might flip the uh, we might flip the specimen over and look at its uh, ventral side to to sketch oh no I don't 
think it's, you know... Need to break out the metallic paints for this one. I guess he's kind of metallic, but he's mostly kind of black and yellow. Alright, oh, and because we can, um, see the entire specimen here, I can get you guys a measurement. From the front of the head to the back of the body, uh, the sunburst diving beetle is 1.27 centimeters. All right. So obviously, uh, I think we, I, I think when I'm starting off with my sketch, I'm going to be starting mine off with uh, the overall oval shape. Um, just making sure that the widest point of your diving beetle is not the center of the beetle. It looks like it's right about here. So you've got, um, we've got it narrow coming out to right around here and then the front and the back. Yeah, so we're going to get kind of this egg shape happening, and we're going to make sure we sketch it really light, because likely we are going to be coming back and changing its shape when we zoom in. This is going to give us kind of our estimated um, size, and it's going to help with our... Wait a minute. Sorry. It's going to help build our shape. So I'm just going to work on getting us a... Uh, I need it higher. Just a little bit. Diving beetles are fun. Um, have I told you the, uh, the, like, um, they call it, uh, they call it kind of a mating war, but diving beetles are adapting against mating with each other. Whereas, like, many animals have, um, gained adaptations to, like, impress their mates or, like, um, choose me, choose me. Whereas diving beetles are, are getting adaptations against mating. It's an interesting story. Have we talked about this before? Let's see. My edges are just a little too wide, so what I'm going to do is I'm just going to pull them in a little bit, because I think they're at a right about the right length. Yeah, so that's going to be a little bit better for me. Um, I'm going to take my really light shape and just make markings on it where I believe the end of the head is going to be, the pronotum, and then the two elytra. So I want to get those lines on my specimen, and then we'll zoom in and we'll check out all of the other cool features on the face and the head. So, I'm going to say the, f the head looks like... It takes up about that much of our space. If you look here, this line right here is going to be separating the head up here from the top um, from the pronotum coming next. Uh, pronotum is the first segment of the thorax. It's where the first pair of wings are connected, and it's also where the first pair of legs are connected. Um, and then from here, we can actually see, there's that little triangle right there in the center. Um, that's the scutellum, a little AB triangle there. And you can see that right at the end of that, that starts a line, and this is a, a vertical line that separates the left front wing from the right front wing, or the left elytron from the right elytron. All right. So that's going to give us a really good shape and place to work. Let's go ahead and zoom in and check out the the head. Uh, one of the things I love about the heads of these beetles is the color of their eyes. They have these really beautiful metallic silver looking eyes when you look at them. So let's see if we can get there. They're so pretty. I was 
was almost there, but then I needed to shift the specimen a little bit because I want to be able to see some of the front of the mouth parts. So I just shifted the specimen just a little bit. That's going to be better. How cute he is! Oh my goodness. Yeah, so you see how he has those really beautiful silver eyes up there in the front. We are looking at a, uh, we call, the, those are compound eyes. They have all of those individual omatidia that um, have the ability to see. I wonder sometimes about the colorations in the compound eyes, because you can see... Let's see. There are there's this kind of circular spot of um, darker omatidia here and here, um, and I wonder if they have like uh, the ability to see maybe different colors or or maybe the tinting changes like how they would see above or underwater. I'm not sure, because these beetles do have the ability to fly. So when I come back to my sketch, now I have an approximate size for my head, but you'll notice that um, the head doesn't cut all the way across. You've got these two little edges over here that come up and kind of encircle the, um, that kind of come up and encircle the head just a little bit. And um, this pronotum actually covers what looks like a little bit of that eye back there. So <clears throat> on our sketch, we're going to take um, these corners here and we're going to cut them up just a little bit. To give us the start of our head. Now, um, to me... It looks like the line that goes from here to here along the back side of the head isn't straight across. There's a little bit of an upward arch to it. And that makes sense because a lot of times the pronotum is rounded. So we've got the start of our head all the our, the start of our head all good. Let me see. I'm gonna get our drawing a little bit closer to the camera. Very good. All right, now um, from here, we're going to take this shape and arch it up, and I want this to be, we had it perfectly round up here, but now that we're looking at it, it they almost looks like there are corners up here, so let's see more like this so instead of having um so instead of having an arch that comes out we're gonna come up and we're gonna give it these little bit of corners here i think that gives it a better shape now that we're looking at our head might want to shorten that guy a little bit um, and now that we're looking at it from this angle, you can actually see two of those palps a little bit lower. Um, they look like they're coming out here from in front of the head. Those are going to be little palps that this beetle is going to use to help kind of push food back to its mandibles. So I'm going to go ahead and just give those little two segmented palps up there in the front. Um, the eyes are going to be L-shaped in here, so let's see. They look like they come down actually right in line with that pelt. And coming down at a 90 degree angle like this, and then going up the other side. And then just making sure that they are symmetrical, right? Because all insects on the entire world are. There we go. Now, um, I like to sketch at least the color lines, especially on beetles like this that have such, such like nifty patterns. So coming up here, it looks like along the center of the head, there's almost this stretched out M shape where um, that's where you've got the dark and the light banding. And then 
I always thought that this little piece here in the center almost looked like a crown or maybe even like a tiara. Um, I'm not sure if that makes sense to anybody else, but it definitely makes sense to me. It almost looks like they're crowned. And I've always thought that these beetles were so pretty. Um, there are a good number of insectariums and zoos around the country that actually has... They, they have these beetles um, and they rear them in their facilities. I have not reared... Um, I have not reared these diving beetles in the past, but I will one day. I haven't collected enough of these guys to take a shot, but I, I should practice with some of my, my native species. That'd be fun. All right, I was trying to get a decent, um, a decent image of our, of our pronotum here. And there's this little bit of a glare because the pronotum is so shiny. I guess we have a word for that. That's glabrous. G-L-A-B-R-O-U-S. As I was trying to get, all right, that's about as good as we're going to get, I think, to get that focus on the pronotum up there at the top. Um, you can see that it has that really pretty gold stripe. Where's my pencil, though? There it is. All right, it has that really pretty gold stripe along the edges of the pronotum, and then you have those two elongated shapes in the center. Um, it almost looks like there's a, a median suture a little bit, but sometimes beetles and other things will have just this little, just a line here in the center of its body. It's, uh, not sure what the purpose of it would be. Um, but we're going to come along here and we want to make sure we do, uh, do that, um, come up here and give that lip because remember the pronotum came up to about, um, up a little bit past the eye because it was guarding that eye. So I want to make sure I have that in here and then just rounding out this pronotum. It does really evenly blend all the way down into the elytra. So giving our long shape like this, and then it looks like the central part of our of our pronotum. I'm just gonna give ourselves a little point here, and we want it to go. We want it to arch down just a little bit. Hmm. Give me a minute. There is this shaping on the back of the uh, of the pronotum, and I'd like to get it right. So instead of going straight across, yeah, something more like this. Instead of going straight across, the back of the pronotum has these kind of, I guess, two arches here where the lowest point is in the center here it comes up and around there are a good number of beetles that have this type of shaping kind of like to encircle the elytra and i'm sure it has something to do with um the function and the way that they open all right so then the internal shape here and getting that stripe here down the side Oh, man! Just turning in. Hi, Marante. It is pretty big, for sure. And it has a teeny tiny cute scutellum, for sure. Are there parallel, are there faint parallel lines down the pronotum? Um, there is only... I see what you mean now, looking closer. I think there is only the one vertical line down the pronotum, but let me double check because I do see... What do I 
what you're talking about. Yes, there kind of are. Let me see if I can show you what we're looking at. I never noticed these before, but someone mentioned, Pi mentioned, was that Pi? Or no, that was Susan. Susan mentioned that if you'd notice those little vertical lines. So right around here, right above the scutellum, there are these really small little lines here and here, and they almost look like wrinkles in the exoskeleton. They don't look like sutures. They're not like different, um, they're not different plates. They're more like just like shaping on the um, exoskeleton, but I hadn't noticed those ridges in the past, so that's kind of a, kind of a cool observation. And something I might add to this sketch, because why not? Near where it meets the scutellum. Yes. So, and I think what they do is this, the ones on the left kind of arch to the left, and the ones on the right arch to the right. So it's kind of like, like somebody put the parentheses in the wrong direction. <laughs> <coughs> I wonder if those have something to do with their ability to, like, swim really, really quickly in the water. If there's some way that that, like, makes the water go over their back in the correct direction faster or something. I'm going to add these two pieces up here that are that golden starburst color. Um, you'll notice that the left side and the right side of this coloration are not exactly symmetrical. And you'll see that with this beetle in general as we're looking at the spots on its back. Um, the spots shapes on the left wing are not the same as the spots on the right side. But most of the pronotum is not covered with those little stripes, by the way. Just trying to get closer to the elytra, but, but far enough away that we have the, still have the ability to see the entire thing so we could get the uh, spots and the coloration taken care of. That's what I was aiming for. Come on. That'll be all right. Yeah. I forgot to draw the scutellum while we were over there. All right, so what I'm going to do is I'm just going to zoom in on the microscope really quick. Ah, that's not going to be good enough, I don't think. Nope. All right, we're going to move it one more time. I want to go and look at the shape of the scutellum before I zoom out and do the overall shape of the elytra and the colorations, because I want to make sure this little triangle guy gets his face too. There we go. 
So right here in the center of our body, um, in between these two lines, we've got a scutellum. And this, um, in this beetle, is not completely pointed. It looks fairly rounded, in fact. So it comes out right around the middle of those lines, comes back in. You've got your little scutellum. It's kind of in this triangular shape where there is a little bit of a point near the center, but it's not going to be like a triangle like many other beetles are. Um, it's got its own unique shape. And so there, from the center of that, that is going to come down um, the in between the elytra. And now we can zoom in and get the shape and the coloration of our, of our top. And I don't remember if this is a male or a female, but we will be able to tell by the shape of the front legs. I just realized to ask, is the scutellum part of the thorax, maybe attached to the mesothorax, or is it part of the abdomen? The, um, the scutellum is a part of the thorax. It's on the thorax. And I'm not sure what exact, like, if it would be on the mesothorax that would be my guess was that it was on the mesothorax because generally it sits in between the first two um the first two wings and the wings are connected to the to the first segment yeah so the mesothorax that would be my guess um, but it's definitely on the thorax rather than the abdomen because the abdomen doesn't start on this beetle until right about here. It has a, this beetle actually has a very long thorax that we'll see, um, once we get this, this guy figured out. So, let's do it. Alright, I want to get this shape. I'm going to make my beetle just a little bit longer. I think that that was the issue for my last guy as to why I thought he was kind of too pointy. He just needed to be a little bit longer, I think. So I'm going to make my beetle come out just a little bit. Oh, there we go. Doop, 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 doop. There we go. We're going to, we're going to darken that line. Say so this one's pretty good. So, I got distracted, and I didn't tell you the mating wars on these guys. So, while we're doing the colorations, I'll share it with you. Um, diving beetles, to mate, the female is underneath the male. And, to breathe, the uh, beetle has to break the water surface to collect an oxygen bubble. And they hold that oxygen bubble underneath their elytra. So their little breathing holes, they breathe from underneath their elytra. And they hold those oxygen bubbles right next to them. So they breathe. Um, but sometimes the males take too long. And um, if they do, the females can actually run out of oxygen. Um, and that's no good because if you're mating and the lady runs out of oxygen, then all your, um, you have not increased the population at all. And so um, females started to gain adaptations to... Uh, to get away from the males, essentially. Um, they are very, very, very smooth, for instance. And um, they would be able to kind of swim away because it was hard for the, for the males to hold on to. So the males developed suction cups on the bottom of their front... I believe it's their protibia. Um, they've gained these suction cups. 
and uh, um, so they're like, aha, now I can section my section cut myself to your back, right? And then we can mate and everything will be great, right? And uh, the females, they had to live with that for a while, and then eventually they adapted and they grew the ability. Um, they gained what we call striations or grooves in the elytra so they gained all of these grooves and they're suck and the so that the male suction cups wouldn't work right um it would be like trying to use a suction cup on uh on like the corner of a tile right you can't do it because it loses that the grippy so uh they were able to swim away because they had striations in their elytra and the guys are like oh no now i've got to figure out a better way to mate and so um the males end up gaining um like specialized suction cups that align with the grooves of the females so you have the ability you can kind of line up the suction cups on the males on the bottom of the male's legs with the grooves on the female's elytra which is kind of cool <laughs> All right. When I start with my when I start with my marmorations or my colorations on my elytra, a lot of times I'll do the edging so that I have something to work off of. And right now I'm just gonna do the right side, and then I want to flip the beetle over, so I might skip doing the colors on the left side. We'll see what happens. So we've got this central one here and the largest dot in the center. So you'll notice that even though um, they're not the same on the left and the right, they still have overall the same kind of pattern. It's just that some of their splotches are going to be slightly different. Um, and that is common in many, in many uh, species. It's like, yes, they might have six spots, but not all of those spots may look the same. All right, so that is approximately what I'm seeing for the back of our elytra or our hard outer shell. Guys, if your lady passes out underneath you, you're doing it wrong. Exactly. But I mean, they're insects, so they don't really know that much. Aha! Uh -huh. It's a male! Check this out! Suction cups! And funny enough, inside of the suction cups nowadays, some of the more highly advanced um, diving beetles will have little hairs inside of the suction cups that also have suction cups. There's suction cups and suction cups. So the closer you zoom into this, the more you're going to see. Because um, these are only the main ones. You also have little hairs that are suction cup shaped. So this is a male right here. Um, and you can see that they're that they're kind of in these lines. And if we've had a female, um, you would see that they would kind of match up that way. Cool. Right? Lots of evolution in a bug that's not getting any. And that's the funny thing about it is like the uh, the sunburst diving beetle, all diving beetles. This is for the family Dytiscidae. All diving beetles. Um, if they're adapting to not get any, uh, that's like, it's difficult to imagine, but it's because of, um, but it's because of the females, you know, need for air. <laughs> oh, man. All right, so I wanted to give you guys kind of an overview what the ventral side looks like of this beetle. Here we go. So very specialized legs are what you're looking at. Um, way up here in the front, you have our compound eyes. Um, there are 
both antennae up there and um, maxillary palps or those mouth palps. Your front pair of legs with those suction cups we were looking at. The middle pair of legs on these beetles, um, they look almost like um, a mixture between walking legs and swimming legs. They, uh, when we zoom in, you'll kind of see them. They don't have as large of like, or like hairs that a swimming leg would have, but they don't have like little tarsal claws that you can imagine like walking them around. They're more fin-like. Um, so they've got these really nifty middle legs. And then our hind legs, obviously, these are really big, giant swimming legs. And so our head is really small up here, but the thorax, it starts way up here, right after the head ends, and goes all the way to down here somewhere. I think right around here, um, where you can see the hind legs connect. That's where the thorax ends. So this has a huge thoracic region. And thinking about an insect that swims like this, they need lots and lots of muscle and lots and lots of power and strength to be able to swim around and all of that. So they've got a big thorax for all of their muscles. And then this section is its abdomen. And you can see clearly those abdominal segments there. Uh, so. Oh, yeah. <laughs> um. Susan, Susan mentioned that she thought I meant like maybe one suction cup. She wasn't expecting a whole bunch of them. Yes, there is a, I think that they started out with, <coughs> <coughs> they started out with fewer suction cups, but then when the females gained their striations, those, those big suction cups had to break off into smaller suction cups because they had smaller areas that they could grip onto. Um, and that's also, I believe, why they've got those micro suction cups now, so that they can kind of grab onto the insides of the striations. Um, really interesting. I love, I um, I love this be this family of beetles kind of story. So you can imagine this same exact shape and send it over here. And I want to draw, I want to draw the ventral side. I don't think it'll take us too long. And I like hanging out with you guys. And I really want to also zoom in and check out the, uh, the head a little bit better. I'm excited to see those mouth parts. So I'm just getting myself a basic shape to start with, keeping it super light, because obviously this first outline is likely to change. But as long as I get it fairly close to my other side, I'm going to be happy. Something like that. I'll be good. All right, let's um, let's just start this way and get zoomed in here. Oh, uh, do beetles and bugs have lungs and hearts? Oh, I love that. Yeah, we can talk about it. Um. Beetles do, uh, we're going to talk about it and insects in general, all right? So beetles and all other insects, they don't have lungs. So they don't have a place where they actually store oxygen, but they do have hearts. Um, and it's not a heart as we imagine it because... Um, humans have what we call a closed circulatory system. Our blood runs through our veins. Insects have what they call an open circulatory system. So insects don't have veins. Their blood is just kind of their body juices and they float around in their body all of the time and all of their organs are kind of floating in their body. Um, and insect blood, instead of being called hemoglobin, like for humans, um, insect blood is hemolymph. Um, 
And insect blood does not carry oxygen though. So humans, when we breathe, our oxygen goes into our lungs. Our lungs help diffuse that oxygen into our blood and then our blood pumps all over our body and helps get the oxygen everywhere. Insects have a... Insects, I don't even have to draw this, I don't think. Insects have a little hole in the side of their body and that's called a spiracle. Like this. It's called a spiracle. And spiracles are kind of like windows to the body. They open and close and they let air in and out of the body. Um, so if an insect notices that they're in a toxic environment or they've accidentally fallen in water and they can't breathe underwater, they'll close the spiracles. But most of the time, they just stay left open so that um, insects breathe through diffusion. So just like how when you open a window in spring, you like smell the um, fresh air come in, that's how insects breathe. They don't pull oxygen in and push carbon dioxide out or anything like that. They, the oxygen is just always moving through the open holes, which are their spiracles. Now, that what's interesting is that those spiracles actually lead to, I believe they call them tracheoles, but they lead into little itty bitty tubes that split into smaller tubes that split into tinier tubes and each one of those little itty bitty tubes somehow feeds every cell in the insect's body oxygen. Um, I didn't take um, insect, uh, what's the word for that? Um, there was an insect class that I wasn't able to take and it would describe that in more detail, but that's what I've got for you. So, um, there's that. Uh, that's how they breathe with, uh, oh, right. All right, right here I've got a head, a thorax, and an abdomen. Insects have what they call an aorta vein. And that's essentially a long pipe with... Um, with little muscle pumps along the length of it. Um, and it picks the hemolymph up from the back of the abdomen and pumps it up to the front of the head and drops it off and creates this circula circulation system in the insect's body. That little vein up there in the top with the little pumps, we that's the essentially the insect's equivalent to a heart, and we call it the aorta vein. Um, aorta like heart. Yes, diving beetles have really long antenna. And so, uh, you can see that here, uh, these antenna actually got, um, kind of bent down underneath his head. So, uh, we could, so we can sketch them on the bottom. Uh, I've lost my good eraser. That's okay. Yeah, we'll leave it. All right, give me a minute to catch up on... Oh, just noticed we have some long antenna. What does it mean? What does that mean the caterpillar in Alice in Wonderland would not really be able to smoke a hookah? Yes, that's what that means. <laughs> that's funny because I hadn't thought about it that way. Um, the caterpillar in Alice in Wonderland, the mouth of a caterpillar is only ever used for eating. They don't have the ability to intake air through their mouth. Um, so, a hookah for a caterpillar would mo look more like one hookah, I imagine, and lots of tubes that run directly to their spiracles, but they wouldn't have to breathe in and out either. It would be better if the hookah just smoked by itself, like it bubbled, maybe? That's how that could work, more realistically, <laughs> in a fake world. All right, what else? Whole bunch of tiny hookahs. Yeah, exactly. 
Yeah, there's no sucking power. You would have to figure out how to make it uh, bubble by itself. You could probably put like a little steamer or something in there. I don't know. I don't know how these things work, guys. All right. So the sides of our heads here, we can see the uh, the big silvery compound eyes from the bottom too. And I'm, my bottom sketch is going to be a little quicker this time. I'm not going to spend as much time, but I just wanted to get a, get a good look and to zoom in to make sure we saw all the parts. What are those little crusty pattern or sand grains? I'm not sure. Oh my goodness, I have never been into sliding rocks and that makes me sad. I know exactly where it was. I just don't remember the name for the um the 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 rock structure. So I was trying to check out for um, mouth parts, different pieces of this beetle's mouth. If we look way up here, we can see this darker area that almost looks like there's a plate here. Um, it looks like if the front of our head was coming down in this triangular pattern, then we have this next section here, which is the upper lip. We call it the labrum, spelled like this the labrum. And then next, we're going to have the mandibles here. So you can see right about here, there's a region that goes from this red color to dark black, and then it starts over here. Those are the mandibles that our beetle is going to be using to nom on food. Um, diving beetles are predatory. They have chewing mouth parts. If you hold them in your hand like this and shake them and squeeze them and scare them, they will bite you. They are not going to hunt you out and bite you while you're swimming in a lake. Um, but if you do grab them, they will bite you back. Uh, they, they do have that ability. In fact, um, diving beetles, uh, grubs are called water tigers. Um, and they are ferocious little predators underwater. Um, all right, so we've, we saw the mandibles. The next is going to be our maxilla. So that's spelled like this. And a lot of times we don't see pieces of the maxilla because they're mostly internal. But, but what we do see are the maxillary palps, which are these palps that we saw from up above, up here. Um, so we can see the maxillary palps from below too. And now that we're seeing them from the bottom, they are, they appear three segmented. One, two, three. One, two, three. So they are three segmented. And then underneath the maxilla, you have the bottom lip. We are all the way down to the bottom lip. The bottom lip is named the labium. And that is right about here. There's that little itty bitty plate, this circular plate. And then you can see there are two more palps coming off. And those are labial palps. All right, so the maxillary palps are on the maxilla and the labial palps are on the labium. And then we've got one, two, three, four segments for those lower um, palps. Now, if you've been hanging, if you've hung out with me before, you'll know that I like to call these palps up here in the front mouth fingers. Um, just because that's what their function is. They sit up here in the front of the mouth and they, um, they push food into the mandibles. And they make sure that they don't drop anything, right? So they need two on the bottom to make sure they don't drop any crumbs. And then they need two on the side to help push. <clears throat> All right. And then we have those decent length um, antenna. These are long, straight antenna, so we would call them filiform, or in the form of a filament. Yep. 
Yeah, those are the male suction cups. <laughs> oh, yeah, we talked about the mating wars in diving beetles. I also have a little drawn video on that, too, if you wanted to check that out. It's in my channel. All right, so the pronotum from the bottom doesn't look very long. You can see it looks like it kind of ends here, and it comes down. It has this It has this same arch that might be even stronger than what it looks like on the bottom or on the top. Let's see. Something like... This. And then there is this kind of central plate here. Um, I'm not sure what we would call this, but it does look like something that would help kind of force the water down the center of the body and probably helps with making swimming go faster. Fast, fast, fast. All right, let's go look at these legs. I don't know if I'm going to sketch him. We're just going to look at him. Is that okay? Maybe I'll draw him. He's so cute. So I was trying to get a really good image of this front leg so you could see what is happening here. Um, because there are a couple of segments that are kind of all bent together. He's, this is the, his leg in a kind of a tucked position. He does have the ability to reach out and swim and crawl and those types of things. So this segment right here, this first one that you can see connected to his body, that is the coxa. So that is our hip bone. We generally can only see the coxa when you are looking at it from the bottom. Um, when you're looking at an insect from the top, a lot of times that's covered by the thorax. Even if you're looking at an insect that, um, like a wasp or a bee, that's more narrow. All right. Um, this little triangle right here that looks almost like a little pizza slice, that is the trochanter. We can see it on this beetle's legs. That's kind of like a knee in between the hip and the first big segment of the leg. Kind of like that. So you got that trochanter. There is a segment that goes from here all the way to back here. And this segment is moving away from the microscope, which is why um, it's caught giving this little bit of a, uh, of a weird depth perception thing. As you got the trochanter and the leg moves away from the microscope for the femur. And then the next segment is actually coming all the way towards us from right around back here all the way up to us where you can see all of these <laughs> the male suction cups are. So the male suction cups are at the very end of the tibia. Got a little bit of a glare now. Switch over to the other side. Cool. So those are, are the male suction cups. And then you can see that that is just the end of the tibia because you still have these two tarsal segments left. One coming out, and the second one that has these cute little tarsal claws. So you've got the tibia, and then the tarsi. And I'll zoom out, and I'll try. We'll get this, guys. I love the top so much. I hadn't try. I hadn't challenged myself at sketching the bottom of this beetle yet. So. This is good experience. Get that guy in focus. All right. So um, from right around in here, we have our coxa. So the front leg is going to be connected to the pronotum. We've got one segment, the trochanter, the femur going out. 
the tibia. I might just make mine, I might stretch out my legs rather than tuck them in like they are here. That's going to make just a little bit more sense to me. And then, um, we've got that suction cup pad. More suction cups? <laughs> oh, man. And then the tarsal claws. All right. And then the second pair of legs looks very similar to, I mentioned they looked very similar to walking legs, except that if you look at the very end of the, uh, of the tarsi, instead of looking like they could walk on their toes, um, they more are elongated and thin and they go down to a point and that's going to be a modified swimming leg look. Also, the trochanter on the middle leg is this little shape here. It's kind of elongated. It's less triangular and more of this, I don't know, acorn shape? Maybe it looks like an acorn. Half of an acorn. All right, so you've got the coxie. That almost looks like Pac-Man with a really long bottom jaw. And then you've got the trochanter that fits inside there. The femur that comes out. And then we have a tibia. The tibia does have... Spines. I don't believe that those have any sockets. And then we have, let's count tarsal segments. One, two, three, four. One, two, three, four, five. One, two, three, four, five. I believe we have five tarsal segments on the middle leg. Um, I can be sure of that in two seconds. Yes, they have five tarsal segments. In fact, um, Dytiscids should have five a five 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 tarsal segment um, tarsal formula. So those front legs on the front legs, there were tarsal segments we couldn't see that were blocked by the um, that were blocked by the suction cup. So we've got those long tarsal segments. They all kind of fit together. So I even build them together sometimes and just give the separation like that so they look like they're all one pad. Um, they do have some hairs that are, travel around along, that, uh, along their tarsi that do give them a little bit of help to swim. There we go. All right, let's zoom out and check out what this looks like. Uh, having a hard time. Yeah, the cox is generally very short. So it almost looks like a ball or a socket a lot of times. Um, it, it can change shape just based on, you know, the body shape of any insect that it's on. But these guys, I kind of think that they look like an open mouth of a Pac-Man. So they can bend the opposite way. So they are... Um, you can take this, uh, you can take this coxal joint and lock it in. And their femurs move in this direction. And then their tibia moves in this direction. All right, so when they're swimming, they're going to go, let's see if I can give you a little swimming uh, thing. They're going to come like bring their legs up and then open their tibia and then pull it back. 
and then curl back up. So they kind of have this kind of thing going. I hope that helps. All right, bye Marley. Thank you for hanging out with us. The top of the leg where the suction cups are. Um, yeah, I can try and get you, I can try and get you that view for sure. Let's see. This is so cool. I'm glad you asked. I've never looked at it this way before. Guys, look at you can see the suction cups. Looky, looky, looky. So I'm wrong. Okay, so I'm wrong. So check this out. We know that the tarsal formula for a diving beetle is 555. Five, five. I always thought that the that the uh, the suction cup pads were on the bottom of the tibia. They are actually the first three segments of the tarsi. Because you can see there's one plate, two plate, three plate, and then four and five, which is why we only saw, I was wondering about that, I was like, we only saw two segments after the suction cups. That makes me, that makes me so happy. That's so cool. Don't mind me. I'm going to go and take a picture of this on my microscope. There we are. Just a single picture. I think we've got we've got a pretty decent view of it right now. Cool. All right. So there's that. Um thank you for asking. It makes me want to sketch that, put that somewhere, and I need to find a p place on my paper to do it. I'm going to do it over here. So the, uh, the first, second, and third tarsal plates on the front leg of a male diving beetle are adapted into a suction cup, wide suction cup plates. And there's three of them, and they have... It looks like two spines on each side, on each segment. And then on the bottom side, there are suction cups. And then you've got the fourth segment and the fifth segment with claws. And I'm going to sketch a couple of those suction cuppers in here because those are really super duper cool. All right. Oh, my drawing is a little blurry. Oh, no. I'm sorry. My, um... How many suction cups are there? That is a wonderful question. I've not counted. So let's flip it over and see. Mm -hmm. 
this specimen likes to slowly move away from my microscope. So it likes to like slightly change the focus. Right as I'm getting to it. It's like running away from me. Very good. So um, we've got... I'm just going to use my, my mouse rather than this guy. It'll be easier for me to count. Let's see. Um, there's two suction cups here at the base. I wonder if they are organized by segment. Because there are three segments. I'm going to say that's probably what it is. We're going to show it this way. So there's this row here that's going to be uh, tarsal segment three. There's this one here, that row, that's the second segment. And then I believe you've got this first row and these two larger su suction cups that are the first segment. Um, so if we want to count the total number of, of suction cups, it looks like one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, um, seven suction cups on the first one. So if we were going to draw it like this. We would do two big ones and then five smaller suction cups along that line. And then you have one more segment. And that segment has one, two, three, four, five, six along that line. And then the final one is one, two, three, four, five, six. So you've got a total of six plus six plus, so 19. 19 little suction cups. Between two and the five at the edges One, two, three, four, five. Oh, there are two AB ones. All right, so on each, yeah, there are two more. So I, so 21. The other two, they're, they're little itty bitty segments. One's here and one's right about there. It's a little bit more difficult to see. <sighs> yep, I see them, Hashi. I'm sorry, I uh, didn't see them at first. You had uh, good catch. They're one of the, so it's it's a cool thing to spend a little bit of extra time on, on these guys because, on, on the suction cup parts of the beetle anyway, because it's one of those things that makes diving beetles unique. So I guess I, I, how I probably should have described it a little bit better would be there's three that are median, one, two, three. Um, there's two that are larger here, so there's kind of that five in a box. And then there's two smaller ones off to the side, one, two, and then right here, one, two. That will give you a better shape than trying to draw them in a row like this. I just didn't see those two first. Now, what we can do is we can check out the hind legs, our swimming legs. Swim, swim. Swim, swim, swim. Swim, fishy, swim. And I liked how somebody said that it, the beetle almost looks mahogany. I thought that was a really cool description of this, of this friend here. All right, so the mesothorax 
the mesothorax ends pretty much right where those cocci are. Um, the the pro and the mesothorax, both of these segments are golden color. So wherever you see that gold end, that's where this segment is ending. Once you get to that mahogany section, that is all the meta thorax or the third segment of the thorax and you guys um might be surprised but the coxal segments on these hind legs they are this oval right here this really like long flat oval right here the pin goes right through it on this side but you can see it on this side too this oval here that is what we would call the coxal plate um or essentially it's the coxy now this little shape here on the bottom that's going to be the trochanter and then the femur kind of wraps around it so that gives you some of the uh, shapes that we are looking at right here and i'm going to go ahead and sketch so instead of having little circular itty bitty coxy the hind legs have so much strength and they need a whole lot of uh Oxy. Um, <laughs> and so you've got these long plates that go like this. Can you imagine the power behind that? Impressive. And at the very end, they, um, they come off just a little bit, kind of away from the abdomen too. And a lot of times the end of the coxal plate will kind of um, go over top of the first abdominal segment a little bit. So we've got those there. Then you've got the, uh, the trochanter that's this type of shape. It's kind of like that knee segment. And then you've got the femur. And the femur is connected to the trochanter, even though it looks like it comes all the way back here to the coxy, all right? So we've got this coming out here. Now a good number of insects, their, um, their coxie are kind of separated away from their body. Um, like even the first and the second pair of legs, their coxie have that little bit of a separation. These are more, the hind legs are more like plates. If I was to run my finger along this, this would be a smooth line until right about here at the end where they come up and over the uh, first abdominal segment. Yes, exactly. Exactly like the coxal plate of the wedge-shaped beetle. And so that's something that we'll see regularly in hind legs of beetles. Um, nice, uh, nice memory, Susan. Is it unusual to have such a big gap between the second and third legs? It's normal in diving beetles. And it is a semi-regular thing that we see but it does have a reason. There is a, there is a reason that our, our uh, hind legs are so separated from our front legs. Um, if you look at the overall location, let's go ahead and zoom out a little bit. If you look at just the overall body shape and then you look at the location of where the hind legs come out of the body, that is a little past halfway. So when the beetle is swimming, um, you kind of want your legs to be almost in the center of your body if most of your power is coming from projecting yourself forward with these legs, right? If they were too far forward, they wouldn't give them as enough power. And you might even notice that um, where the 
femurs come out and they find the edge of the body here, that is also the widest point in the body. And I bet you that has everything to do with, um, with the way that they swim and, uh, and, uh, more physics than I took. <laughs> um... The coxie are the coxie are fixed in place. Yes, and that's funny. It does look like there's a little nail and hinge. Um, that is not the case. I think that it just looks like that. But I love that it, that that it reminds me of. I want to check out the tarsal segments. I mean, that really looks like a nail and pin. That's so fun. <laughs> oh, that was way far. There, that's better. So this is a swimming leg. Um, you notice that the tibia is pretty short. Um, the tibia is nice and tiny. Let's see. So we've got the femur that's big and strong. It comes out about as wide as the body. You have the tibia that comes down like this. And they are jointed on this angle, so I'm going to go ahead and fix up my femur just a little bit. And then it should have five tarsal segments. One, two, three, four, five. Yes. So if you look here, it also looks like he does have... Long tibial spines. Like two. Two longer tibial spines. And then five tarsal segments coming on down like this. And you'll notice that they are all very smooth together. These are swimming legs. This is like the swimming leg. So if you ever see an insect um, and you're curious, you see these legs down here? They swim. That is, um, they use them kind of like oars. So um, those hairs will kind of form together along the edges and they... And they kind of help create an oar or a wider paddle, and that's what they will use to reach out and swim. Almost imagine like a, a, a frog. Like if you if you tried to do like a frog swim, I don't know how we call it, where you take your legs and you pull them up like this. That's how they swim. All right. Let's look at the abdomen segments. Aha, uh -huh. as I expected. There's a tricky one. All right, here we go. So you can see the entire abdom abdomen from this image. I wanted to make sure I wasn't lying, and I'm not, so we're good. All right. And most people might start with this segment right here thinking that, look at that big wide segment, that looks like the first one. That is actually our second abdominal segment. Do you see this little sliver up here? <laughs> That's the first abdominal segment. And it does go all the way across, but the coxa go over top of it, all right? That area where you where it looked like there was a pin, um, that's actually going above our first abdominal segment. So this is one here, two, three, four, five abdominal segments. So I'm gonna darken my edges here and here. Very good. And then our first abdominal segment is nice and small right here. All right, so that's the first one. The second one is significantly wider. 
So more in that range. And then we have three, four, and five to take care of. This abdomen looks almost like it's curled in just a little bit, but that's okay. So we got one, two, three, and then four, and then I'm going to shorten this just a little bit. Five. You know what? I didn't think I was going to be happy with him, but I'm pretty happy with him. I think we did good today. So we've got both a dorsal and a ventral view of our sunburst diving beetle. I think we've gotten a whole lot of diving beetle taken care of today. All right, so... It actually was a toy beetle carved of wood all along. That's so funny. It was not. This beetle was swimming around in Arizona at some point. <laughs> all right, so that is our friend the sunburst diving beetle i'm going to go ahead and switch over to my table cam oh i um, there it is okay i wanted to switch over to the table camera switch this over to say sunburst diving beetle all right, so this is what my sketch looks like today. I didn't um, sketch both colors of the tops of the wings or both sides of the legs. I uh, skipped those two. But alas, um, we have our summer diving veal from a dorsal point of view and from a ventral point of view. And I had so much fun analyzing and checking out the, the suction cup on the male here. Um, so that was a good time. And definitely the, the sidetrack on the breathing and the um, blood flow and respiration. I enjoy talking about all of that stuff. And what I couldn't remember was insect physiology. I never took an insect physiology class. And so there are some gaps in my knowledge when it comes to those types of things. And I've been meaning to read. I have an insect physio book I've been meaning to read. I just haven't gotten around to it yet. So there we go. We have our the head nice and little here the thorax which is more than half of the body needs to be big and strong and then we've got our abdomen here yay all right so i hope that everybody here has enjoyed their time with me and enjoyed sketching this beetle with me oh i'm gonna go ahead i'm gonna cross hatch inside of the dorsal at least the ventral has a lot of ha stuff happening in the mouth region so i didn't really want to cross hatch in that but the head will make it look a lot more, a lot better with texture, so. Very good. I'm happy with that. All right, so I hope that everybody had a great time and that you had a, you had fun checking out this um, this diving beetle. Keep in mind, I do teach on a platform called OutSchool. I teach to students ages 5 to 8, 9 to 12. We sketch together. We um, color pictures. Today I, we talked about, ooh, today I talked about ants with the kiddos, and we talked about different relationships that ants can have with other creatures so that was a lot of fun um so if there's if you know an insect or an animal lover out there who might be interested um you can go ahead and find my link in the description box below that is your reminder to go ahead and um subscribe to my youtube channel that also gives you the opportunity to chat with us in the chat box because only our um subscribers can chat with us um if you had such a good time today and you would like to um send me a dollar or two uh there is a little tip over here that's where that qr code goes to it goes to my paypal account and um if you want to share your sketch with me i have some of you who share them with me every week and i really love seeing all of the art that has been um 
inspired by these live streams because some of you i i absolutely love your art and many of you do add color um as you are sketching and so i just um i just really love seeing it all so feel free to shoot it to me in an email at trisha at the and I think that's it. I hope that everyone has a, a wonderful rest of their week. I will be around on Sunday at 4 so we can live stream and sketch another buggy friend. Um, and then next Thursday at 10 p.m. Eastern. So I hope you have a wonderful rest of your week and stay buggy. Bye, ladies and gentlemen. Oh, I'm glad. Yay, Hashi says it was pretty exciting. Good, good, good. Thank you, Hashi. Thank you, Susan. Thank you, oh, Marley, for hanging out with us today. And um, Pi was hanging out with us for a while, and I super appreciated that. And Caitlin, so thank you all. And Sewing Nancy, you were here too. So I thank you super for hanging out with us and asking questions and interacting. <laughs>